Why is this unplugged from it? What? Yeah. That setup looks vaguely familiar. Yeah. It's a Forbes Kids, like, oh that my gosh, man, it's brought back memories, like. Okay, it's good enough. No one's gonna sit in front of this, right? Oh, I see jokes here. Poor Joe. I might stand in front of it like this.
Four Oaks. Good evening, Four Oaks. We're so glad that you're here. What a beautiful day. I'm so blown away by what God has done. What a beautiful day to gather here for our Good Friday worship service. Can we just give the Lord a hand? Can we praise Him? The sun is shining. But as we come here to gather for our Good Friday service, God invites us now to come and to worship at the foot of the cross as we all stand here shoulder to shoulder. None of us above one another, below, but at the cross, we're all equal because we're all in need of God's grace. Amen. The scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God who shed his perfect blood for us. As we come now and as we worship him, we receive the forgiveness that he has given to us because of the sacrifice that he was made. So let's stand together. I invite you to stand as we consider the gravity of our sin here in this place. We also understand that we have a king whose glory was displayed on the cross. And while we consider the sorrow and shame of the brokenness that we bring, we understand that we have a king who has poured out his unending love to every drop of blood that he spilled. The one who is mocked as king, he was the true king. And it was his endurance to the cross that brought us forgiveness, the greatest display of Christ's love. And this evening we celebrate that together. So now as God invites us in, let's bring the scenes of the cross before us. Let's worship now together as God's people who have been purchased by his blood because he made peace by the blood of his cross. So grab your worship guide and follow along. We'll read a little bit together. We'll sing together. There's notes in there for the message. But now as we begin, let's remind ourselves of just the sweetness of the gospel. Let me read and then you read the underlined portions. Scripture says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on his head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Let's read what Isaiah wrote. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So now let's gather, let's sing, O oh, Sacred Head. Now we do.
oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand.
scripture says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall cease and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Let's read. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's how Christ displayed his, his love for us. So let's sing. experience anew incredibly how deep, how wide, how long, how vast is your love for us. Lord, the, the sin that 
took your son to the cross, you have dealt with decisively through his death for us. Lord, we, we can't fathom this. We can't wrap our eyes and our heart and our mind around it. It's, it is, as we sang, vast beyond all measure. And so, Lord, we pray that as we open your word tonight, as we reflect on that evening and day 2,000 years ago, where you cried on the cross, it is finished. Lord, that that would seep deep into our souls. And that this would not just be merely one more year celebrating, remembering one more time a religious holiday. But in fact, Father, it would be a soul penetrating, soul transforming time as we meditate upon your word, as we come to your table, and as we remember anew your grace given for us through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may take your seats. Um, what a glorious day for us. Thanks so much for being here. You know, a lot has changed this past year, but one thing that has not changed is that you guys are still allergic to the first eight rows of, of, our, of our space here. But we're here to celebrate Good Friday, and I want to begin our meditation this evening with a question. And, and, and here is the question. Have you ever dreaded doing something so much that you felt physically ill? Were you, have you ever had a time in your life where you were so nervous about something that you weren't even sure you could bring yourself to do it? Um, maybe it was a time where you had to do some public speaking. I feel kind of like that right now, okay? <laughs> Um, maybe you were, maybe you were uh, taken to the top of a ropes course and you were told you had to, to go across and you knew you were safe, but it sure felt like you didn't, or you had to do an audition or a tryout, or there was a test or examination or an interview. Think about a time like that for yourself. Now imagine yourself though, having to stand trial for something serious. Um, imagine a time where you are in deep financial or legal trouble. Or imagine having to bring yourself to make a terrible confession to someone you love. Now that's a whole other level of fear and dread, isn't it? But undoubtedly though, probably the greatest human fear and dread anyone can ever have is knowing that you are headed towards a sure and certain death. That is something that has always united humanity. Maybe you're in a cell waiting execution. Maybe you're flying in a plane that's about to go down or a building that's about to collapse and you know it. That is a life and death dread. Yet on the night of his betrayal and trial, Jesus was facing all of that plus something even more dreadful, something that from a human perspective is impossible to conceive of. And we wanna read about that together tonight and meditate upon it from Matthew chapter 26. And you can find this passage and some other texts and quotes we're gonna be reading from in your, in your booklets. But listen to Matthew chapter 26, probably a very familiar passage for most of you. It is the last night of Jesus's life, his last time with the disciples. He's in the garden. He's about to be betrayed by one of his own. And let's pick it up there. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, sleep and take rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You know, for as much as the divinity was and is on full display and power, at the resurrection, it's the humanity of Jesus. It's the weakness of Jesus, isn't it? That's on full display in the events leading up to the cross. That Jesus was in great dread the night of his betrayal, it's not in dispute, is it? Not only does Matthew, who by the way was an eyewitness, not only does Matthew tell us here that Jesus was sorrowful and troubled, but Jesus himself tells us this. He says, I am very sorrowful even unto death. In other words, such great anguish was the Son of Man under that the anguish itself felt like death. In the parallel passage in Luke, we won't turn there, but remember Luke, Luke the physician, tells us that Jesus was in great agony, such agony that he sweated drops of blood. A real medical term used by Luke the physician for a real medical condition. But we have to understand it wasn't just the physical agony of crucifixion, which we know is the worst and was the worst of all kinds of death that Jesus dreaded. It wasn't merely physical. In fact, it was the spiritual agony that he was to endure that had torn up his soul. You see, the Lamb of God, in order for him to take away the sin of the world, was going to have to bear the sins of the, sin, of the sinners of the world. The Father, just like we just got through singing, was going to have to, to, to turn his face away while Jesus was on that cross crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His own father was pouring his wrath out upon him. Jesus, Galatians tells us, was being cursed by his own father for sins he did not commit for a people who had committed them. You see, this was the locus and the focus of the dread of Jesus. This was why in all his humanity, he fell on his face and he pleaded with his father. Parents, can you, can you get that image in your mind? Your, your child pleading with you? And he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Not once, not twice, not the three times. And parents, you know when your child asks you something for, th something for three times on end. It has an added meaning, doesn't it? An added urgency, an added importance. And here's the question for us, because we do know how this story ends. We do know that Jesus endures. We do know that Jesus goes to the cross we do know that Jesus lays his life down. He, we know he does say, not my will, but your will. And here's the question of the hour that we want to think about just for a few minutes tonight. How was he able to do it? What compelled Christ to persevere in that garden 2,000 years ago for you and me? How was it 
that the Son of Man could be so resolute. And let's, let's not factor out the humanity of Christ, folks. He certainly could have chosen otherwise. Only a few minutes later, remember, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. And Peter, as he is wont to do, thinks, or acts before thinks, and he cuts off the ear of the servant's high priest. And Jesus, what does he do as he's fixing the ear back on? He rebukes Peter. And he tells him, don't you know, Peter, I could call a whole legion of angels to deliver me right now? Don't you know that? Yet, he didn't. And we want to understand what was at the heart of Jesus' resolve. Now, understand, there are several reasons that we can give for this, and each of them would be theologically correct. For example, we could talk about the obedience of Jesus, right? We see it here, not my will, but yours. He submitted to his father. His father has sent him to do this, has asked him to do this. And Paul tells us in Philippians 2, he was obedient even to death on the cross. We could talk about his forbearance. See, Romans 3.25 tells us that while God had forgiven all the sins of those who had asked for it under the old covenant, those sins had not yet been paid for. And Jesus certainly was coming to pay for those sins as well. We could talk about his mission, right? Jesus tells us in Mark 10, 45, that he came as a mission to give his life as a ransom for many. And all of those would be entirely true. But there is another answer for why Jesus was resolute on that night. There's another answer for why he persevered, and it's a reason we don't often think about. But it is no less true than any of these that I just mentioned. And it's simply this. The reason Jesus persevered to the cross was because of joy. And I want to read Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. You can follow along on your sheet. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And here's the crucial line, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer of Hebrew tells us that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, and we have to ask, whose joy? Of course, on one hand, it was for our joy, our eternal joy, our everlasting joy, but that's not the joy that the writer is referring to here. The joy that's being referred to here is nothing less than the joy of Jesus himself, his joy. And this echoes, does it not, what we've heard before from the apostles. For example, John 17, 24, also on your sheet. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Listen to what Jesus does here. He says, he's praying to his father and he says, Father, I desire. In other words, Father, I strongly long for. Father, I'm persistently asking. Father, I'm diligently seeking the thing that lies at the deepest part of my heart. And what lies at the deepest part of my heart are the people, the ones that I will die for. And I'm praying that they would be there with me because when that happens, my joy will be complete. See, the, the joy that was set before Jesus, the thing that drove him, steadied him, propelled him forward was his own joy. Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, which is also in your booklets, says this, it was the joyous 
anticipation of seeing his people made invincibly clean that sent him through his arrest, death, burial, and resurrection. And we have to understand, people of God, this wasn't a general joy in what his death might make possible. It was a specific joy in what his death would do for a particular people. In other words, your name, if you know Christ, was written on his heart. It was etched across the deepest part of his soul, and it was his joy that propelled him forward, knowing that his death would bring you to him. Orland has another illustration, and it's I'm going to read from it. It's also in your booklet. I think it's a powerful one. He says, a compassionate doctor has traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe afflicted with a contagious disease. He has had his medical equipment flown in. He has correctly diagnosed the problem and the antibiotics are prepared and available. He is independently wealthy and has no need of any kind of financial compensation. But as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted refuse. They want to take care of themselves. They want to heal on their own terms. Finally, a few brave young men step forward to receive the care being freely provided. What does the doctor feel? He feels joy. And his joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help and healing. It's the whole reason he came. How much more if the disease are not strangers, but his own family? This is Jesus. When you come to Christ, Ortland goes on to say, for mercy and love and help in your anguish and perplexity and sinfulness. And I love this line, church. You are going with the flow of his own deepest wishes and not against them. What does all this mean? For us here on a Good Friday in the year 2021, it means that we don't merely look back to the garden and the cross and thank Jesus for his sacrifice, although we most certainly do that. What we do on this Good Friday, it means that we need to understand the thing that brings the greatest joy. Because the scriptures tell us this, the thing that brings the greatest joy to the heart of Jesus right now is when you and I come to him. You know, when you've had an argument with your spouse and you've blown it and you've royally sinned or you've broken something that's sacred, you do get comfort, right? When your spouse says that they will forgive you, that that is a comfort. However, it's not the, the construct or the concept of forgiveness that is most important to you in that moment. What you really want is what forgiveness provides. You want restoration. You want reconciliation. You want closeness. You want unhindered fellowship. In the same way, Jesus doesn't want us to merely know on this Good Friday that we are forgiven, although we most certainly are. He wants us to be reminded of what that forgiveness has procured. It's given us him. He wants us, which means that the thing closest to our hearts and to his heart is our acknowledgement for Oaks of our need for him. And as we confess our sin, as we confess our brokenness, as we're running to him as the only cure for our disordered souls, when we do this, make no mistake, Christ is not repelled by these things. We are running towards his very heart. And this was the end game of the cross. His joy of having our joy be in him. 
for the joy that was set before him, the writer tells us. He has endured the cross. He, has, he is despising the shame. And this can be so hard for us to understand because when we look into the depths of our heart, we see all that is broken, don't we? We see all that, it, that, afflict, that afflicts us. We see all that is wrong, all that is, is, is messy, all the secrets that lie in the depths of our souls that we fear if people only knew this thing about us, if God only knew this thing about us. And Jesus says, but I do know. And that's why I'm here. And what touches the depths of my soul with joy is when my people know they need me and they come to me. That's what Jesus and why Jesus endured on that night 2,000 years ago to be in relationship to you. Do you know him? Are you trusting in him? Are you coming to him? Or are you bringing your broken soul to him? Jesus says, that is my deepest joy. I'm gonna pray for us and as our worship team comes back up and as we prepare to take communion, we're just gonna spend some moments reflecting on Hebrews 12, one and two, reflecting on Matthew 26 thinking about, yes, reflecting on the death of Christ, yes, reflecting on your sin, but reflecting on the heart of Christ and his joy when we turn to him. That's why he came, church. That's why he died. So that his joy and our joy would be complete. Let's pray. Father, would you, as we look at this diamond of your glorious atonement for us on the cross. Lord, let, let us see it all in all of its splendor. Lord, we pray that you would connect our hearts to the reality that it was for your joy, your joy in knowing us, your joy in bringing us close to you and the fellowship with you that propelled you into that night. And Father, we pray that our joy would be complete by coming to you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Four Oaks, it's only right and fitting that we would respond to what we've heard tonight by taking the Lord's Supper together. So if you'll grab the elements with you, I want to read to you from John 15. It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. For Oaks, the cross of Jesus Christ is what Martin Luther calls the great exchange in which we give to him all the curses and the punishment for our sin. And he, in response, gives to us his perfect righteousness and all the blessings and the benefits of the gospel. And every time we take the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of this exchange that Jesus was beaten and broken. And he bore the weight of our sins so that we could be healed and forgiven of all of our sin. That he was cast out so that we could be welcomed in. That he was criticized, scorned, and mocked by the angry voices of the crowd so that we could hear the one voice that really matters. Our Heavenly Father say, you are my beloved son, my beloved daughter. I am pleased with you because the perfect righteousness of Christ has been given to you. Jesus was forsaken so that we could never be forsaken. As First John says, oh, what love has been lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. That there is indeed no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. This is the gospel, and this is why we take the Lord's Supper tonight, that Jesus died so that you and I could have life both now and forevermore. That is the joy that motivated Jesus to go to the cross. So Four Oaks, in remembrance of Jesus Christ, let's take this bread together. Jesus' body was indeed broken for us so that we could be made whole. But not only that, Jesus' blood was poured out upon the sins of the world so that our sins can be cast aside as far as the east is from the west. Let's drink the cup together. Folks, why don't you stand and respond with gratitude in your hearts, remembering that not only Jesus has died, but that he has risen again and that he is returning one day to receive all those who are looking to him. Let's sing.
displayed for us on the cross and just meditating it on, on that tonight has filled our hearts with praise. And God, we are struck by the fact that it would be your joy to bring us into your kingdom as sons and daughters. And so now would you dismiss us from this place with the reminder that Jesus' love covers all of our sins the reminder that he did not stay dead, but that he is the resurrected Lord, and that we will gather again in a couple of days to proclaim that once again as a church body. And so it's in the name of Jesus, the crucified, buried, and risen Lord, that we gather. It's in your name. Amen. You are dismissed.